Hi. Good morning. Welcome. All right, so uh, Sunday is going to be a big day because you've got a homework assignment due and we're going to have the exam. Uh, I had a question before class on what's included for the exam and so I thought I'd pull up the uh, schedule for the semester. We can take a quick look and um, see that what we've got is chapters 1 and 4. Chapter 2, Chapter 3, and Chapter 5. And so uh, we're going to discuss future worth analysis on Thursday. And so that will be included. And today's lecture is also included in the list of topics. And so you know, all this is fair game for the midterm exam. All right. So are there any other questions related to the announcements before we get into the New material? All right. <clears throat> Let's take a look at what we did last time. All right. Last time, we had this in-class exercise example. And so, in the example, we had two options. We were comparing Mitsubishi and Hyundai. And both of the options had the same useful life. And so we were taking all of the cash flows to the present, and then how did we know which one to pick? The one that gives you the most money in the present, because they had different uh, cash flow diagrams in the future. But what made this problem a little bit easier than some other alternatives we're going to face today is in uh, the last lecture, when we took everything to the present, at least it had the same useful life. But when things don't have the same useful life, then we have, to, uh, we have to make them the same useful life before we take everything to the present. And so here's an illustration. We don't know what option A and option B is. It may be excavating equipment. It could be uh, simply a savings account. It's, uh, the bottom line is it's something where we pay money in year zero. We know that because the arrow is downward. We pay something in year zero and then we receive a return over time. Both of the options, we're going to use the same discount rate. And by discount rate, what I mean here where it says I equals 4%, that's the rate that we're going to reduce all of the future cash flows to the present at. Remember, we use the word discounting to mean you're taking from the future to the present. And what's the word that we use to describe when you're taking money from the present into the future? The opposite of discounting. It's compounding. Compounding is the term we use. It is investing, but compounding, what it means is that, remember, you're earning interest on the interest. And so essentially, that's, that's the application of the method that we use when we're moving money either to the future or the past, is either discounting or compounding. So for these, we're going to discount from the future to the present. But the challenge is, not only do they have different returns over time and different investment amounts, but they have different useful lives. Whatever option B is, it appears to be more durable. It's lasting longer. And so um, we can't simply take the money from the future to the present as shown here. We have to make them so that they have the same useful life. Otherwise, we won't get the right answer on which one is best. So the first way that we can compare the alternatives is something called the repeatability assumption, or the least common multiples approach. And in the least common multiples approach, what we say is we want to have the cash flow diagram that lasts the same number of years. Option A, this equipment lasts for six years. Option B, the equipment lasts for nine years. So what we can do is simply at the end of option A's first cycle, let's buy it again. So it's called the repeatability assumption because you repeat purchasing the item in year zero and you repeat the same cash flow diagram for the revenues. Except for that we're not buying it in year zero again, we're buying the next item in the future. 
So what year would we buy it? What becomes our quasi zero? We're starting over in year six, right. Now, why is it that we buy it in year six and not buy it in year seven? Because you'd have a gap in the revenue. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have revenue every year because uh, this is showing revenue every year. And so we want to have the cash flow diagram repeat so that the cycles terminate at the same time. So we're going to buy the item again in year six, which means that we get the revenue again in year seven. And so we get six periods of revenue. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six periods of revenue. And so we're going to repeat option A three times, and we're going to repeat option B two times, and they'll both end at year 18. So here's what that's going to look like. We've got cycle one, cycle two, and cycle three. So this is called the least common multiple approach because uh, we don't want to have too long of a cash flow diagram. I mean, we could make it uh, 180 years and they'd both end at the same, or probably we could have it end after 90 years. But just for simplicity, we'll have it end uh, as soon as possible where both of the cycles terminate at the same year. All right, so let me give you the in-class exercise for today. We're going to use this least common multiple approach to compare the alternatives and find out which one is best. 4%, so you're going to use the table lookup method for some extra practice with that. The 4% table is on the back of the page. And what I'd like you to do, let me, okay, yeah, I've already, I've already browsed away from the uh, first solution because I'm asking you to get the experience of drawing the cash flow diagram, first of all, is draw the repeats of the cycles and then go through the process of taking the future money to the present. There's an extra one there. Everybody get a piece of paper? All right. So find the present worth of A and B after you do the drawing. I got a good question when I was walking around. Someone asked, how do you know how many cycles to do of each? And it's just something you have to get with practice. Uh, for example, if you had one option that lasts two years and another option that lasts six years, the way to make them end at the same is to repeat the one that goes two years three times and then don't repeat the option that lasts six years. Or if it's three and four, you just think, what is the number of cycles that makes them end the cash flow at the same time? And I think for three and four, the least common would be 12. So it just takes a little bit of practice sometimes. All right, so here was our cash flow diagram that I asked you to first sketch it out yourself so that you can see when it terminates. Was there a question there? To this one? Well, um, the answer is sort of. You can sort of add half a cycle. But you can't buy half of a tractor. You know, you can't buy, you know, whatever investment is required. What, what you're, I like the way you're thinking, because you're thinking, is there some other way to make them end at the same time? And th the answer is yes. There are other strategies. And so, uh, for now, I'm just going to say sort of. There's sort of a way. And we'll talk about two other strategies besides the least common multiple approaches, which we've done so far. Let's finish looking at this example, and I'll, I'll address the issue you bring up, because it's a good one. All right, so here's the uh, solution. Uh, oops, all right. So here we are. Option A, discounting the cash flow to the present. So here's the original investment of 11500 It's already at the present. And then I'm taking the entire annual series of the revenue. So it's 5,000 every year, and there's 18 of those payments coming to us. So I do P slash A takes an annual series to the present. Interest rate of 4, N equals 18. So the factor for that, you can see on the next row, I went and looked up from the table. It's 12.6593.
So you're supposed to go to the next page and find here on the table where the uh, P slash A, find the present of the annual 18 years, that's where I got the 12.6593. All right. Um, so that's the revenue part of it. Then I want to take, there's two payments, the payment in year uh, 6, and then I bought the item again in year 12. And so adding it all together, I, the, the lookup factors from both of those years, the present worth is 35525 And as I was walking around, it seemed like everybody had gotten that. That's the present value of option A. The present value of option B is the same approach where we're taking all of the revenues to the present. So here's the 4100 and we're getting 18 payments of that, taking it all to the present. And then here's the repeated cost when we bought the item again for 16200 And then there was the original 16200 that's already at the present. So combining those three components together means that the present worth of option B is 24321 so ultimately, we're comparing alternatives. Remember, the whole big idea of Chapter 5 is making decisions, choosing between alternatives. And the best alternative is if we should get option A. So that's the final answer, is choose option A because it gives us more revenue than option B when everything is discounted to the present. Now, there's a pretty big assumption behind all of this. What we were saying is that we think we can buy this equipment again in year six for the same price. That's kind of a stretch. There aren't too many things in the world where the price stays constant for six years. And so the LCM approach assumes repeatability. For us to do the, the solution we just did, we invoke what's called the repeatability assumption. So all of that Let's assume that the cash flow diagram is repeatable. Let's assume that, number one, we can buy the items again for the same price. That's part of the repeatability assumption. And the other part of the repeatability assumption is, let's assume that it can generate the same revenues in the future that it generated the first time around. Now, maybe that's a good assumption. Maybe it's a bad assumption. There are some things where uh, computers, for example, if you spend $1,000 on a computer today, in the future you can spend $1,000 on a computer and it's going to still be a pretty good computer because computers are always getting more sophisticated, faster, more memory. I mean, you'll have a better machine, but the chance that you can buy a similar item for the same price is probably pretty good. But some things the repeatability assumption is, is really bad for. Um, and so an illustration of where you maybe wouldn't want to use the repeatability assumption is buying a vehicle because it seems like the cost of cars is always going up from year to year. So just keep in mind that sometimes it's not true. So if you can't buy the item for the same cost as today, one way to handle that would be, okay, so you don't think you can get it for 11500 so make a correction. You know, maybe make that future amount a little bit larger than the first time around. You can make a, a correction if the repeatability assumption isn't valid. So will the revenues and costs be the same in the second cycle as they were in the first cycle? And it may be that, if we go back to this cash flow diagram, maybe there's more competition in the future. And so maybe since there's more competition, your profits are getting smaller. Or in some cases, it could be that um, that because of inflation, reimbursements are also increasing. And so the, the reason I bring it up is just to keep it in your mind that these are always, these cash flow diagrams are always estimates and based on assumptions. And sometimes you need to do a reality check to the assumptions just to make sure that um, the final answer you get isn't skewed by unrealistic expectations. Okay, so that's the repeatability assumption. Here's what's called the contract services approach. Now, the contract services approach says item A was going to end in year six. Remember, that was the difference between item A and item B is their useful life. Item B lasts for nine years. Item A lasts for six years. So based on the name contract services and based on what you see in the cash flow diagram, 
What would you guess is happening? What does the company do for the last three years if they had previously purchased option A? They're renting it, right. So what it is, is this company, for the first six years they bought the item, maybe it's a piece of equipment, they purchased it, and since they owned it during the first six years, they didn't have to buy it again. They bought it one time, and then they get all of that revenue in the future. But then the item is worn out, it's finished, so in years seven, eight, and nine, they have to find some other alternative. And so their alternative was to go to a rental agency to pay 4000 for each of the years, and then they can receive the revenue the revenue of 5000 that they were expecting. And so this is assuming that it's a direct substitute, that whatever they're renting for years 7, 8, and 9 is a perfect replacement for the item that they originally had purchased in year 0. So that's the essence of contract services. Yes, question? Uh, that would be given. And so the way that you know is, you know, you'd have to get on the phone and start calling different equipment rental places. Um, and, you know, every agency has a different price when you rent a car, so you want to check around and find the alternative that's the least expensive. Minimize your costs to maximize your profits. Yes? Right. So you're asking, why is it that they got to use the equipment between year six and seven, but they only pay at the end? That's probably some of the negotiation that they had with the rental company. That in this case, they're not paying up front. They get the equipment at the beginning of year six, and they use it for the whole year, and then the rent is due at the end. So that's a good point. Maybe more realistically, they would shift that cash flow diagram, and so it would be six, seven, and eight, right? That's maybe how it sometimes is structured. But that's just a matter of... Uh, of negotiation between who you're getting the contract services from. If it's, if it's not buying equipment, it might be that you are um, uh, using a subcontractor on a construction project. And in, the case, in cases like that, if you have someone else digging foundations for you, then oftentimes subcontractors do the work up front and then they get paid after completing the job. So that's an illustration of way maybe where this cash flow diagram would make more logical sense. The main idea is that for the item that ends too early, you extend the cash flow diagram by contracting out whatever the equipment is meant to operate. So what I'd like you to do on the back side of the paper is use the contract services approach to find out which alternative is better. Is it better to buy the item that will last the full nine years, it's a little more expensive, or buy the cheaper item? It only lasts for six years, and then you have to rent. And the thing about renting in years seven, eight, and nine is look, that you're only earning 1,000 more. The difference between the, the cost and the revenue is only 1,000 each year, and so that's a pretty thin margin. So it will be interesting to find out which is better, A or B. Option A. So your strategy was you move that to your six. Six. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Uh, all right. Well, this isn't the clearest example I've ever put up on the screen. Boy, this is just a perfect illustration of how you shouldn't have a chicken scratch answer. But anyways, let's see if we can make heads or tails of it. So the strategy that I followed was. We've already got 11,500 at the present. That's what this is, negative 11,500. And then we had the uh, annual revenue of 5,000. So I'm trying to take that to the present. And I looked up the factor uh, P slash A for 4%, N equals 9. That's where the 7.4353 came from. So that takes the revenue to your zero. And then there's two factors that I have to apply to the 4,000. 
One of the factors takes it from an A to a P, so it takes it to your 6. And then the final factor, this 0 0.7903, discounts it from your 6 to your 0. Okay, so overall the present worth of option A is 16,903. All right. So one thing I was really happy to see as I was circulating around is it seems like um, you're getting much better at seeing the strategy of as soon as you see the cash flow diagram, people are recognizing, all right, I need to take that A to a single amount at year six and then from year six to year zero. Like you're starting to see how to uh, break down a problem into the steps and the pieces it needs to be to uh, move money to the past. Now when we get together on Thursday, we're going to do similar things but moving the money to the future instead of moving money to year zero. Just to compare alternatives in terms of future value. So any questions on uh, part two of our in-class exercise? Let's talk about the third way to compare alternatives. What we're doing today, remember, all three of these methods are ways to compare things that have a different useful life. Our first method was using the repeatability assumption, which is just have a different number of cycles. The second approach, contract services, says that instead of buying again, we're just going to lease or rent the item for the remaining number of years. Early termination says, instead of extending the short one, let's shorten the cash flow diagram that's too long. Remember, we're trying to make them the same number of years. So option B is too long. Let's somehow make it shorter. And the way you can make it shorter is don't keep it for the whole useful life. You can just sell the item. And so you can see this green line. What that's showing is, uh, in year six, what we're doing is we're going to sell the item and then we don't get the cash flow for year seven, eight, and nine. So we're foregoing those revenues by taking a single one-time lump sum by uh, selling the item. Maybe it's salvage. Maybe we're taking it to car to the dealer and trading it in for some other item. In any case, uh, we're selling the option, uh, selling the item early. So I don't have any calculations that go with this alternative. But the main idea with early termination is that there would be, again, an A. And so your solving strategy would find the P of the A. And then there's going to be a single future value that's a revenue. And you'd have to take that future value from year six to year zero. Now, one thing that's important to point out is that you receive the revenue at the end of year six and the single amount. So there would be two amounts in year six. And so you have the option of either having your A be six years long and include the 4,100 that occurs in year six, or you can combine the 4,100 and the uh, salvage value together as a single P, in which case the A would only be five years for moving the 4,100. So any questions about early termination? It would be either. You can do it two ways. If it's five years, that means you're combining this revenue with the payment, the, the lump sum payment for selling the item. Yeah. What I'd usually do, I'd usually keep the A separate from the salvage value, just because um, those two amounts represent different things. One of them is a the revenue, one is the sales price of the item that you're getting rid of, you're disposing of the item. So you can get the right answer two ways, but I would recommend that you keep the A as drawn, and then you, you're basically, what you're doing is the value of that salvage hopefully is at least equal to the value of the revenues that you are going to get in the future. You know, when you discount those revenues to year six. Any questions? All right, well, speaking of early termination, all right, I'm going to let you out five minutes early. So I guess that's another day to put in your calendar. One of the rare times during the semester, we'll finish early. Remember that on Sunday we've got an exam, so you can be studying for that. I'll see you on Thursday.